Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get this started. Thank you everyone for joining All Pueblo Grows Seed Lending Library's monthly presentation. Um, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, integrated pest management and common June garden pests. Please stand by. Launching the presentation. Moving my face out of the screen. There we go. So, um, the... Uh, Oh, there we go. So IPM, what is IPM? IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. It incorporates a variety of pest management options. It's designed to minimize health and environmental hazards um, while maintaining productivity, profitability, if that's your thing, and aesthetic values as well. So some of the systems that we can use, they manage management options vary with the crop. As you can see, this is a raised bed where my pointer is pointing at. Um, I wish I could make the pointer a little bigger, but anyway, what you can, what's going on here is that this is a raised bed and they've got mulch in there along with the drip hose. So um, if you didn't know already, uh, raised beds are very, very easy um, to maintain as far as the weeds are concerned um, because a lot less of the weed grows into a raised bed. Um, this one over here on the left side is, uh, looks like a Zurich garden. Over here, um, looks like they've used um, rocks right here and there's gravel in between the rocks. That's another way of controlling the weeds um, and you know, providing a little bit of ground cover for the, for the plants themselves. And then over here on the right side is an orchard. You can see that they're all growing in a line right here. And there's um, you know, probably a ground cover protection along the base of the trees that protects them um, and uh, allows them for more watering. Um, their needs. Um, so IPM does consider the system, plant species suitability, susceptibility to disease, age of age and condition of the of the uh, plant or whatever. Um, some, just something I want to kind of point out real quickly. Um, here in Pueblo, you you know, we notice that there's a lot of uh, dead or dying trees, and a lot of that uh, is because of the age and condition of these trees. A long, long time ago, they planted a whole lot of these elm trees. And elm trees don't have that much of a life, you know, as everything does, it lives and it dies. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why these trees are starting to age out. Um, and so management options and resources, um, yada, yada. Soil, water, and weather conditions also affect IPM. Local insect and disease patterns also can, uh, are taken into consideration when you're dealing with IPM. Um, for instance, the flea beetles, you know, we plant trap crops of like radishes or whatever um, in order to control the local insects because um, they always show up at a specific time of the year and then we can plant those trap crops and deal with them that way. Um, uh, strategies, um, there's cultural, um, choices, um, for instance, different plant choices, uh, planting and maintenance practices. Again, like those trap crops is a good um, way of uh, doing uh, plant choice control. Biological uh, natural predators um, like birds that eat the bugs, um, caterpillars, uh, even ladybugs that eat the aphids. That's a good biological control. Physical controls, um, use traps, barriers, hand picking into insects, maybe using a vacuum cleaner, um, you know, um, a bucket of soapy water, you pick them off of there and throw them in a bucket of water, um, trying to do it that way. Non-chemical control options such as diatomaceous earth is a really good um, way to control. Chemical controls, in Colorado gardens, only about 4% of the pest problems warrant the use of pesticides. So again, if you're if your go-to method is just chemical, um, you're, you're, you probably should reconsider that. Um, get in contact with your local extension office and maybe you want to, you know, find out another, a different method, a more natural method of dealing with that so you don't run into any problems. Um, the diagnostic process. So the first thing, of course, we want to do is we want to identify the plant because if you're trying to identify a problem with the wrong plant, you're gonna come up with the wrong solution. That's kind of obvious. Um, identifying the problem, maybe more than one problem, maybe it's too much water on top of, you know, so then it causes the plant to turn yellow. Um, uh, 
What's that called, Cherie? Uh, chlorosis or something? Yes, yeah, chlorosis. Huh? Yes, that's correct. Chlorosis, okay. Oh, wow, I got it right. Yay! <laughs> so identifying the problem, there may be more than one, like I was saying, if too much water, um, the plant will turn yellow, um, and so then it becomes more susceptible to um, different diseases or even fungus, um, any kind of a bacterial infection that it might get. Um, you want to evaluate if your management efforts are, are needed. Not every problem needs to be fixed. Some of them will fix themselves, especially um, taking into consideration, and I keep going back to this, the flea beetles. Flea beetles love to attack a young and pra practically every um, insect will do this as well. You know, just like we, we like um, young, tender, you know, plants to eat. They are so tasty. And so does the bug. You know, they also like tasty, tasty, young um, foliage to eat. So if the plant is growing a little more than, you know, it's, it's a little, you know, it's reached juvenile stage or even adult stage, <laughs> then, you know, it's probably going to fix itself. So evaluate which methods will be most effective at cost and time and the impact on the environment. For more information, you can always go to Pest Management from Boulder County Extension. Um, I can um, maybe copy that link address into your chat. Uh, if I can find my way over to, hey, Cherie, can you post that into the chat? I can't seem to get my thing back. Yes, these two links. Where's my thingy? Whoop. Hold on a second. Uh, no, I can't get my thing back. Anyway. Nah. Um, and then the Colorado Master Gardener Garden Notes is on cmg.colostate.edu. Um, IPM Plant Healthcare is, is the title of the Garden Notes. It's number 101. Um, Can I go on? Cherie, did you get that? Yep, I'm going to get those posted in the chat. Go ahead and go on. All right, thank you. Um, common garden insect and disease problems in June. So this is the middle of June. It's almost the end of June. It's almost July 4th, actually. So these are some things that we really need to consider right now. Um, it did warm up really, really fast this year. And so now we're having to deal with some problems that kind of come on later in the year. Um, so Plant disease can be caused by bacteria, fungus, and virus. All pathogens are host specific. Um, so if you're having one thing that affects one plant, it doesn't really necessarily affect another plant or another type of plant. Most insects are also host specific, such as the flea beetles. Again, I keep going back to that. Flea beetles have a very specific plant that they, plant type that they go to. Um, squash bugs are another one that are host specific. They only feed on that specific plant. Um, a few are generous and will infest multiple species, or not many though, but the insect life cycles drive the management decisions and insect feeding patterns help with the diagnosis control options because if you know what you're looking for, you'll know how to identify your pest and then you'll know how to control it. So one of several insects that feed on elm leaves. We were talking about elm leaves. Um, so the larvae do the most damage. Um, as you can see, the uh, leaves of you, and most of us have elm trees right now that look exactly like this. They have this yellowing pattern on here. And sometimes we'll see these flea beetles that come into the house and everything. I've gotten several calls already on the helpline, like, what is this? How do I deal with it? You know, so it's not really the beetle itself that's doing the damage. Over here on the right side, you'll see the larvae, and it, what it's doing is it's eating the underside of the leaf and then causing the uh, chlorophyll, um, yeah, chlorophyll, I guess, to be eaten away from the leaf, and that's what causes the yellowing. Beetles undergo complete metamorphosis. Elm leaf beetles overwinter as adults, so you can kind of see this on the bottom of the, of the diagram there. They overwinter as adults in protected locations, such as in the leaves and the sticks and branches, rocks, things like that in your garden. And then the ble beetles, the bleedles, the bleedles, they fly the trees with emerging leaves and lay their eggs. 
the, um, the eggs will hatch and the larvae feed on the underside of the leaves, skeletonizing the tissue. Then they crawl to the base of the tree, pupate in the soils or folds in the bark. The adults will emerge and fly into the canopy. They mate and then they lay eggs and yada, yada, yada. It's the same thing over and over and over. They are used generally are two to three generations per year. So that's why it's always a problem. So one of the ways that we can deal with the elm leaf beetle is by using these, um, you know, it's basically saran wrap um, around the band of, uh, of the trunk. It's sprayed with insecticide such as uh, carbile, um, bifenthrin right there. Uh, let's see, uh, tempo, delta methrin. Oh, these are neem oil is a really good natural one. Permethrins are also kind of, or you know, it's an okay one to use in an organic environment. Um, spinosad, um, also known as conserve. So the band to trunk with insecticides, previously noted, prior to the larvae moving to the bottom of the tree for pupation. Um, so obviously it doesn't, doesn't prevent the first generation damage. And the reason why that is, is because first you have to identify that that uh, insect is doing the damage and then you're able to control it because, you know, by the time you identify and know what's going on, it's already too late for the first generation. Okay, so in 2017, I guess the elm leaf miner um, was a more damaging insect. It, um, you can identify it by uh, these little larvae on the right side with their little black, um, I don't know what those are. They don't, I don't think they're eggs. I think they're little poopies. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how you can identify those. They do the same damage, more or less, except that these feed on the top side of the leaf. Okay, so now we're going to talk about flea beetles again. Um, the adults overwinter in the soil, in the leaf litter, or other protected areas. Same things as the other beetles. And then in the spring, they lay their eggs in the soil. Um, and then the larvae emerge, feed on the roots, and then the root hairs. And then they pupate in the soil. And then the adults emerge from the soil, and they feed on the leaves of various plants. They produce shot hole damage, such as the little holes. So as you can see um, on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see this uh, what, uh, very close up um, picture of the flea beetles. They're kind of iridescent little beetles and they, they're called flea beetles kind of, partly because they jump when you kind of get near them, <laughs> like little fleas. Um, large rear legs allow them to jump. So they love the nightshade family, such as uh, tomatoes, potatoes, um, I think radishes and cabbages, and I know they live arugula. Um, they like the cabbage family, evening primrose, and others. Controls plant larger transplants because again, they like they like to feed on those really young, tender, delicious um, foliages. Um, high seeding rates, and then you can thin them. Plant radishes as a trap crop. Another thing that I've noticed that is uh, also a good trap crop is arugula. Um, I don't really like arugula a whole lot, but I plant the heck out of it just so that I can control those flea beetles. Um, and then floating row covers, which is the, um, the picture you see down at the bottom left, or bottom right, excuse me, with the white cover on there, you just kind of cover up your plants. The floating row covers allows enough air and light to get into the plant to keep, to allow it to keep growing, but keeps the beetles out. Um, you can vacuum your plants, <laughs> um, you know, it's like a dust buster or something like that, or a shop vac, just be really careful not to suck up the whole plant. <laughs> you can hand remove the eggs. What you're looking for is these eggs uh, that you see over there on the left, uh, right side, um, is they look like these little uh, orange little things. It's always, they always lie the, lay the eggs on the underside of the leaf for protection from other predators. Diatomaceous earth applied as a dry powder to the plants works. Garden pesticides containing carbile, which is trade name is seven. Um, again, that uh, permethrin and also neem oil works, uh, but for about a week, and then you have to reapply it. Grasshoppers. Let's talk about grasshoppers. I haven't seen a whole lot of grasshoppers, but I think it's important to talk about them now, because now it's going to get start getting really hot. We're going to start seeing a lot more grasshoppers. 
So they are the most difficult insect to control because they are highly mobile. They lay their eggs in the soil. There's over 100 species in Colorado. And during periods when local outbreaks are developing, control usually involves using sprays or baits. Now, if you know for a fact that you're going to get uh, grasshoppers, you probably could get away with putting out a bait early. Um, so the female grasshopper will lay an egg pod an inch or two into the dry, undisturbed soil in the late summer or fall. An egg pod, that, and this is one you see on the left-hand side over there, and that's wh what it looks like. <laughs> Usually contains dozens of eggs. And here's something that's really fascinating about grasshoppers. It always amazes me that when the tiny larvae hatch and burrow to the surface, they start molting immediately to emerge as undeveloped miniatures of the adult. So as soon as you see them, the tiny, tiny, tiny little grasshoppers, that's what they're gonna look like for the whole rest of their little lives. Their favorite foods are plants in the grass families, such as corn, wheat, barley, alfalfa. They're not too picky. They can eat many other types of plants. And it is un not uncommon to see grasshoppers chewing on the leaves of a tree. I've seen them all over elm trees all the time. And uh, they're always eating the grass beneath them. Um, if you got one that you got to wrestle out of the garden like that, Lord, help me. I don't know what you do with a grasshopper steak. Managing grasshoppers with baits and sprays, of course, during periods when a local outbreak develops, control does usually involve using a spray or a bait. To be successful, these need to be applied to developing stages of grasshoppers and concentrated at the sites where the egg laying occurs. And now, like I was saying before, if you know you're going to have a problem with your grasshoppers, you could probably get away with putting out a, a bait, you know, a little earlier in the season to kind of get ahead of the, of the game. So some of the most common ones to use are uh, carbile, which is the trade name seven. You can use uh, Promethean. They have many trade names. Uh, I don't, I can't remember any right offhand. But you'll see down here at the bottom, you'll see where my pointer is, Nosema Locoste. And it's called Nolo Bait or Simaspore. That's kind of the most common one to use. And we're going to talk about this just in a little bit of detail here. So the bait contains a pro, it's a protozo, protozoan, Nosema. Speaker just turned off. Is a biological control option that may be considered for treating grasshopper breeding sites. This is sold under the trade name Nolo bait or Simaspor and can produce infection of many species of grasshoppers. Because it is selective in effects, only affecting grasshoppers, sometimes its, it's use is considered desirable. So again, if you're going to put out a bait early, this is the one that I would use. And this is a picture of the bag that looked that um, what kind of what you're looking for when you go to the store. You're kind of going to be looking for one of these pictures. Any questions so far? Anybody? I'm good. Am I here by myself? Okay. I'm still here, Derek. It's all good. Okay, thank you. I, I can't see anybody else, <laughs> so that's why I'm asking. Okay, so let's go on. Um, so once the grasshoppers have reached the adult stage and migrations occur, some insecticides may be applied directly to the plants. Such applications have only a short effectiveness. Damage can occur before the individual grasshoppers are killed. Furthermore, the choice of insecticides is more limited since few allow direct application to I'm going to wait for that to go away. Garden fruits and vegetables. Okay. Any questions on the grasshoppers? Grasshopper, grasshopper. Somebody just dinged me. Hello. Uh, okay. Sharon typed uh, in the chat, um, do grasshoppers still get that big? I think, I think these photos are doctored. <laughs> yeah, these photos are, yeah, they are totally, <laughs> I would hope they don't get that big. No, these are just some fun photos that I found here and there all over the web. They just kind of make the presentation a little more interesting, that's all. <laughs> but thanks for asking. <laughs> okay, let's talk about squash bugs. So a lot of my squashes are starting to, you know, they got flowers now. 
Um, and once they get the flowers, they're going to start having the actual fruit starting to develop. And so now we're going to start seeing squash bugs. So this is what they look like um, right there. I'm kind of circling around it with my pointer. This is what their eggs look like. They're kind of bronze in color. You'll see them on the underside of the leaf of your squash, the pumpkin squash, summer squash, zucchini, um, ravioli. Wait, no, not ravioli. Um, <laughs> well, you get the idea. Um, they can be the most destructive insect pest of winter squash and pumpkins. Feeding damage results in wilting of the vines, often with the plants being prematurely killed. Um, problems are most common in warmer areas of the state and tend to be worse following mild winters. Overwintering occurs in the adult stage. They hide under debris, usually previously infected squash plants. That's why we kind of recommend it when you have a, a really big infection, you kind of want to get those plants out of your garden, put them in a bag, throw them in the garbage. They emerge in the spring when days start to warm. Egg laying usually begins around June, which is now. Egg clusters are found on the underside of leaves. Again, here's another picture of the egg clusters with a little bit of these guys starting to hatch out out of there. They're like, mm, I'm hungry. What am I gonna eat? Um, and then the nymphs hatch from the eggs on a light green color. They grow and become more gray and more gray, and then they start to develop, and then they get, you know, what we see is the um, typical squash bug, you know, shape. During hot or cold days, it will congregate near the base of the squash plants. They do produce the second generation, and these adults will, are the ones who will overwinter. So some of the control methods that we can use, you can either hand pick them, can be very effective. Attention should be given to the eggs, though, which are easily detected in garden surveys and can be crushed when they're detected. They're kind of hard to squish. It's kind of like a uh, bubble pop, pop bubble, whatever you call it. Yeah, um, egg surveys should be done at least once a week when the egg laying is likely to begin. The area around the base of the plant is also a site where the insecticide application should be concentrated. Diatomaceous earth and pyrithians applications around the base of the plant can be an effective method to control squash bug and is a treatment allowed in a certified organic vegetable production. So the fact sheets on here um, are available at the uh, extension.colostate.edu. You're looking for 5.521. Just do a search basically on these and you'll find them. Um, Elm leaf beetle, flea beetles, grasshopper control, and squash bugs. Thank you for attending. I can't believe that's it. <laughs> okay, so I have another presentation if you're interested. Let me just go find it. Let's see. Yeah, while he finds the other presentation, does anybody have any questions? You can use the chat or you can unmute um, yeah. if you'd like to ask. I can't see the chat. So you'll have to, somebody will have to read it to me. Sure. Yep. I could do that. <laughs> work in this way. Okay. So now we're going to talk about late season crops because it is, you know, the, the season is going really fast this year um, because it got hot so fast. Um, we always want to start planning on, you know, I don't know about you all, but, you know, December and January is when I start planting my spring garden. Um, I get, I start my tomatoes in January. I have a tendency to plant them really early, but I also use uh, cold frame, uh, you know, walls of water. Um, I had some of the toma tomatoes that I have that are producing fruits right now. I planted those in March, I think the end of March. Yeah, the end of March, early April. So, and I already have tomatoes. Isn't that awesome? So based on that theory, three months out, we can start planning our late season crops and start worrying about cold frames because when it starts snowing and everything else, or even with frost, it's not, we can't, we don't have to shut down the garden yet. We can still continue on with our planting and our growing. So many vegetables do thrive in the cool weather, including the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, lettuce, radishes, rutabagas, spinach, and Swiss chards. Now, I'm going to pause just for a moment so, because I know you're all furiously writing down these crop names. Um, an interesting note about kohlrabi and rutabagas, one of my favorite ways to cook these 
is to roast them in the oven like a potato. They're really good that way. Brussels sprouts are really good uh, roasted in a pan with some olive oil and some balsamic. Mm, making myself hungry over here. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to go on. <clears throat> so Pueblo, Colorado is in USDA hardiness zones 5B and 6A. Um, let's see, where are we? We're like right over here in the green over there. Say, uh, 5B and 6A, so that's minus 10 degrees through minus 20, and then my, whatever that is, that is, because there's a line through it. Um, I think we've, if I'm not mistaken, I think we have adjusted our hardiness zones. Um, Cherie, do you know anything about that? Yeah, they did adjust them um, semi-recently, but, um, yeah. okay, but this reflects that, because it used to just be zone 5, but now we're considered 5B, so... Okay, cool. Awesome. I knew I had the right slide. Yay. Um, so frost, oh, what happened? Okay, well, let's go back. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's weird. I <laughs> forgot it does this. <laughs> so CMG Garden Note number 722 talks about frost protection and extending the growing season. Um, so I guess that list of plants was all we had for the, you know, crops you want to consider growing in the fall. Um, sorry, I'm sure I could go on more about that, but um, doesn't have, seem to have anything in here. Frost protection, heat is stored in the soil. The sun warms the soil in the day, as we all know, and then we cover uh, our crop to trap the night heat in. Soil is, soil is the heat source at night. It's uh, an ambient temperature. A lot of times we can plant inside of a floating row cover, which gives two to four degrees of frost protection. So now's the time if you're, gonna, if you're actually gonna grow these crops, you might wanna consider looking now to buy um, floating row cover either on sale. It's not so expensive. It's kind of expensive though. So look for it on sale. This is an example of a window cold frame. It's basically just a couple of boards put together like this with the window frame on top of it. Of course, it needs to have a, a way to lift it up um, in a day when it gets really, really warm because you don't want to bake your plants. Um, this is an example of a tea cold frame. So this is a stake planted in here and then um, this basically plastic draped over the top of this thing here and it's got a little string right here. Um, to um, hold some of that away from the plant. Um, this is kind of ideal because you can roll up the plastic, as you can see this little roll right here, um, in order to uh, mimic the same effect as the window frame lifting up um, when the uh, weather gets a little too warm. This is a pipe cold frame. Frank, I think you have this type of situation installed at your garden plot um, over at the Miracle Community Garden, um, and this works really, really well. Um, uh, provides, and not only that, but you can also put hail shield over the top of this in order to, uh, to provide a little bit of, you know, protection from the hail from these crazy thunderstorms we get around here. Um, plastic cover on concrete mesh frame. The concrete mesh frame is um, very, very durable. You can get it at um, um, Big R sells for about $25 a panel um, and um, then you can just cut it to your needs and just bend it and mold it into whatever shape that you want to put it in and then you put the plastic wrap around it um, and ta-da, there you go, there's your, there's your thing. Your plastic, got, your plastic does need to be held up off the plants or the plant will freeze where it's touched by the plastic because there's no insulation between the plant and the cold. In the daytime, you wanna open at least a crack to prevent overheating, as I was saying previously. Um, plastic over mesh frame two to, provides two to six, two, <laughs> two degrees to over six degrees of frost protection. It's great for cool season crops that tolerate some light frost you do need to add two to six weeks on each end of the growing season for this to you know, actually produce the crop that you're looking for. It's very poor though for warm season crops that are intolerant of a dip to 32 degrees. So again, you kind of want to plan your crops for when you're going to be 
doing a fall garden. Um, <clears throat> this is a type of um, situation here, plastic over mesh frame plus a space blanket. This is um, if you're at a really high elevation and it gets really, really cold really, really soon. Um, like we're, we're gonna start seeing probably these temperatures um, that we're, we'll need for this type of situation uh, along about the middle of August or the end of September, middle of September kind of area. Um, um, this example, I actually did one of these one time and it worked really super well. Um, plastic over the mesh frame with the Christmas lights. The Christmas lights will provide um, six, six degrees to over an 18 degree of um, 18 degrees of frost protection. Um, we had, me and um, two friends of mine, we did this in our garden and we had lettuce all the way up to Christmas time. It was awesome. And you open that thing up and all the steam just comes rolling out of there in the middle of a snowstorm. It's pretty cool. Um, let me just go back to this real quickly. So it does say one string of 25 lights of C7 Christmas tree lights. Now, these are not the LED lights. These are the actual bulbs, you know, the old style uh, glass with a filament inside of it. Um, I'm not sure about the LEDs. I've, had, I've seen some people, they've used a heat lamp and uh, the heat lamp does tend to uh, cook the plant a little bit. What are you doing, Maggie? Okay. okay. Um, so the Christmas light and the space blanket, it's a little overkill, but for some higher elevations, especially up in the snowy countries, uh, snowy, uh, you know, countryside, whatever thing, you're, you're really going to need this type of protection. Okay, so this is the type of situation that I use for my tomatoes every year. Um, again, like I was saying, I start my tomatoes in January. Um, and uh, by, you know, February or whatever, I'm ready to actually plant these. February or March, the first part of March. I'm able to plant these in the ground using these walls of water and they do provide a lot of protection against the cold even when in the middle of a really heavy snowstorm particularly in Pueblo because the snow does tend to melt away really really fast um, I wouldn't recommend using these in the dead of winter because you know it um, sustained freezing temperatures does cause the soil to just absolutely freeze and the plant will not be able to grow but it does warm up the soil where this is installed. So it's kind of a, you know, should I or should I not kind of thing. So kind of have to use your, your best uh, discretion. So any questions about all of that? Nothing so far in the chat, but anybody okay. feel free to unmute or type in. Okay. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions from Jane. Jane, thank you very much for um, asking some questions from me. I do appreciate that immensely. Um, the first one I want to talk about, you had a question about um, ornamental grasses, um, you know, uh, propagating grasses, how to propagate. And the best answer I can give to you is um, one of the ways that you can do that is with, uh, you know, you put, um, you wait for the, uh, the tuft of the uh, grass to, um, I'm not sure if you can see this picture very well. Nope. Okay, I can't make it bigger. I don't know how. <laughs> anyway, you can kind of see where they start to have these little things that pop out and they're like little tufts. Yeah, they look like, um, well, they're little, little tufts. <laughs> and you, what you do is you want to wait for those to completely dry out um, and then you can cut those off and carefully put them into a paper bag. I wouldn't recommend using a plastic bag because they, they could mold. Uh, put them in a plastic bag, I mean a paper bag, <laughs> to finish drying them off. Um, and then once that has completely dried, then you can either shake the bag. If you have a whole lot of it, you shake the bag real good and you'll see that there's tiny little seed down at the very bottom of the bag. And then you can plant those. Um, as you can see, um, ornamental grass, uh, dividing uh, ornamental grasses is recommended every few years once they're established though. And this gives you the two inch, two for the price of one 
effect that budget-minded gardeners appreciate as well as increases and enhances the growth of the plants. Um, it's easiest for this method, but some produce well with seed. Uh, do you have any questions about the grass seed? No, thank you, Derek. That was helpful. I've got them in plastic. I'll put them in um, paper. Yeah, you know those um, those uh, lunch sacks that you can buy at the store, you know, to put your kids' lunches in? Those work really well. For Perfect. If you have just a little bit. Aside from that, though, use a paper uh, sack that you get from the grocery store. Cool. Okay, uh, another question we had was... What? Okay. Oh, sorry, that was uh, not meant to happen. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so another question that Jane had was propagating yucca. Um, so we love to have yucca out in our plants, in our landscapes. They're very beautiful. By the way, I'm not sure if no, many of you know this, but the white flowers that the yucca will produce every once in a while, those are actually edible and they taste delicious if you chop them up and put them in your omelet in the morning for breakfast. Um, you can cut them by division, root cuttings, stem cuttings, and seeds. Stems and offsets can be cut. The bottom few inches stripped of leaves and the cuttings planted and treated gently until they root. So basically what you want to do is you want to dig a nice hole in there, maybe put some uh, fertilizer that's good for a cactus or whatever down in the bottom of the hole um, and then cover that up real well and then water it real good, you know, about a month or so. And then hopefully it'll start to, it'll take root. Um, you can also collect the seeds and plant them out, but be patient because they are very slow to sprout. If you want to speed up the process, you can. Um, you can. Um, my recommendation on that is to um, plant them indoors um, in your seed trays or whatever, but you'll need to have it in a very high, hot, humid, humid, humidity environment. <laughs> humid environment. <Yeesh. laughs> Still learning how to speak. <laughs> So um, yeah, they are very easy. I mean, I have a couple growing out in my landscape right now that I rescued from the, uh, from the park out there at the Pueblo Park. Um, they were just laying along, the, uh, along the, the trail that I found one day and I picked them up, brought them home, planted them and poof, there they are. It did take a while though. It took a good two years for it to finally, you know, start turning green and everything. So you, again, you gotta be patient. Thank you, Derek. That's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. We have a question in the chat, Derek, about how do you, how do you apply diatomaceous earth? Do you want to handle that one? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. The diatomaceous earth. Um, so the diatomaceous earth, you just want to sprinkle it along the base of the plant, and um, if you can, apply it to the to the bottom side of the leaf, but it doesn't typically stay. So you just want to kind of, you know, powder. It, it is a powder. They do make um, uh, applicators that you can buy at the at the store um, for diatomaceous earth and other powdered um, pesticides that you can use. And it works really well in that to just kind of get a little pump action going in there to just kind of poof it all over the plant. But basically, and if you don't have that, that's fine. You just want to kind of put it all over the ground or along the base of the plants. Um, you can also sprinkle it, sprinkle it on top of the leaves. That's fine. The plant will grow just fine, um, just like that. Um, doesn't hurt it at all. Um, you may have to reapply it about, eh, I don't know, maybe once a week, you know, every two weeks, something like that, just to kind of get your uh, squash bugs under control or flea beetles or any kind of beetle. Okay, so let's, um, let's move on from the yucca. And now, and now, oh, come on you. Okay, my computer is no longer responding to my needs. Come on, come on, there you go. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Propagating choyas or walking sticks. So the propagation of these cacti, just like any other cacti, can be propagated by division of its stems, 
So um, basically, like you know, like um, the big paddle, the big ones that have the big paddles on them. You can take the paddles off, and it wherever you, it separated from its mother plant. You can just kind of stick that into the ground and after a while it just kind of roots and it takes off and whoop, you got a new plant just like that um, which is accomplished naturally by dropping them from the limbs of the plant if you choose to manually propagate sever the stems and replant them in sandy dry soil making sure not to damage them too much in the process it's really that simple folks you just drop it in the ground and it grows cool thank um, you Derek that is easy Sorry, what? Thank you. I was just saying it sounds easy. Yeah. Yes, it is very easy. <laughs> very, very easy. Um, you can go out in the desert a lot of times and you can get one plant, one of those toyas, especially when you're flowering. It's a really good time um, to, you know, uh, get those little buds that you can see in this picture right here. Those little buds right there um, are, well, not that bud. There, that one right there on the right hand side. That little flower right there um, is the part that you kind of want to, um, is a really good part to snap off of there and bring them home and plant them, mostly because they're not prickly. Uh, <laughs> but failing that, you can also take the entire um, leg off of that and plant the whole thing in the ground and it'll grow. It will grow. Okie dokie, artichoke. Okay, Derek, in the chat, um, tips for growing a few plants, if you have any, uh, Brussels sprouts, lettuce, and okra. Sure. Um, I do have a tip for the okra. Um, so my friend Christina showed me this tip the other day, and um, I can attest it's already working. Um, so what I did, what, what she told me to do and what I did do is I, I um, put the seeds in a glass of water, overnight and then um, you know soak them in the water overnight um, and then I put them in a paper towel on a plate in a warm area um, and I covered it over with saran wrap for two days and after those two days they started to sprout their little roots and then I took those seeds out and put them in the ground you only need to put them in just like half an inch um, maybe less um, and they're um, within I think it's only been a week they're already starting to show so that's one way to planting the okra. Another way to growing the okra is you want to, you know, if you're trying to get a good early start, of course you want to grow them indoors, plant them indoors. Um, it also prevents uh, against um, some of the other um, pests. I'm trying to think of one, like, I'm not sure the flea beetles like those. But anyway, that's one of the ways that you can grow the okra. What was the other one? Let's see. It was um, Brussels sprouts and lettuce. Um, lettuce. Um, I'm going to address the lettuce thing first. So the lettuce, what I've done in the past is I just take a big, um, so I went to like Fox's and I got, um, I got like four different kinds of lettuce seed, right? And I put it in a bowl. I kind of mixed it up and everything. And then I just throw it out there in my garden and just fly, be free, grow for me, kind of thing. Well, what ended up happening was that my lettuce crop started getting way out of control. I had a lot more lettuce than I knew what to do with. Um, so um, I kind of just let that crop go to seed and then I collected the seed and everything. And then, you know, over the last four or five years or so, I've kind of more or less developed my own seed, you know, blend or whatever. Um, it's, you know, it's my blend and it grows in my soil and my garden. That's why we save our seeds. Um, and so um, this year I did something a little different. This year I actually went to the effort <laughs> and I planted little rows about, uh, let's see, about six inches apart. And I put the seeds in there, you know, and I, I actually did the whole thing you're supposed to do <laughs> for once. <laughs> and so that's one way that, um, you know, lettuce grows really, really easy. You got to keep it moist. You have to keep it very moist the first week or so, and then it'll start to come up. And then after that, um, you, you only have to water about every two days or so. Um, after it starts to bolt, you can either pull it out completely because it turns bitter or just let it bolt. And then you can collect the seed from it. 
Um, the other plant, uh, Brussels sprouts, you said? What was the other plant? Yes, Brussels sprouts, uh-huh. Brussels sprouts, okay, Brussels sprouts, um, I grew them once. I'm trying to remember what I did. It was really easy too. Um, they do take a long time to grow. So you kind of want to start them indoors um, in the spring, early in the spring, by the way, um, and get them, you know, so that they're able to withstand an onslaught of the veggie beetles, whatever. Um, and then once you plant them, you plant them, you know, just like any other vegetable, um, like okra. And here's another thing too with the okra. Um, so Brussels sprouts, because they take such a long time to, um, to grow and everything, um, along with the okra as well, you can actually plant them as a companion plant along with any other vegetable that's out in your garden. Um, so one of my favorite things to do is to plant the um, okra amongst my onions and my beets and everything. Um, I think I could probably say to do the same thing with the Brussels sprouts. Um, because once the beets and the onions are, you know, harvested out and everything, by then the um, the Brussels sprouts or the okra is ready to start producing, and you know, so that's just kind of a natural, you know, cycle. Um, so, you know, companion planting it works. Use it to your advantage. Let me uh, take that out there. Take that out there. There we go. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, yes. Somebody wanted to know when will, if, will there be a meeting about collecting seeds and best practices to have viable seeds for next year? So I was just trying to look up the schedule because, yes, we do have a, that yes. coming up. Um, and I just need to see what month that is really quick. Uh, yeah. I'm pulling it up. And because right this now. year, you know, because of the, COVID, yeah, because of the COVID thing and all, you know, I mean, we might have to redo our schedule or whatever, and that's fine, you know. But, um, but yeah, stay tuned. It is coming. Um, Sharia is looking it up right now. Yes. So it'll be in August next next month. We decided August. to not have a swap and then um, or a meeting, and then in August on August 29th, we'll do the seed saving. Um, August 29th. Meeting. Okay. Cool. So there's your answer. August 29th, we'll be talking about saving seeds because, you know, it's late fall and, or well, middle of fall, whatever, fall time. And it's time to start saving our seeds and getting ready and planning our garden for the next year. So that's what we'll be talking about then. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, it's almost time. We got five minutes left to our session today. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate your time.